And welcome again to Cottage Talk. I am Russ Goldman. This is our match reaction show. Phones five to three victory against Leicester City. Craig Coben has joined me to do this match reaction show. He was at the match today. So we're going to break it down in the next, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes. As long as we want to talk about foam, a huge foam victory. We're going to talk about it. Before I go to Craig, as always, please do subscribe on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. It does help other foam supporters find us. Okay, Craig, let's not waste any time. Give me your opening thoughts on what you watched at Craven Cottage. A, a nice victory for Fulham Football Club today. It was a fairly easy victory. I think the scoreline flattered Leicester City because after Kearney scored the fourth goal, I think we uh, sort of pressed the cruise control button a little bit. Um, you know, Leicester City actually put us under some pressure going forward but they left a lot of space behind and we were able to exploit it pretty ruthlessly uh, in the game. Um, so the game ended 5-3, but it really wasn't that close. It's funny because uh, watching it myself, and uh, I agree with everything that you said, Craig. What's interesting is that I'm glad that you said this because Leicester City did have their opportunities throughout the match. They they absolutely did. They, they've got some quality players there, don't kid ourselves here they do have quality players but as you said and i think overall Fulham were more ruthless more clinical and it actually could have been worse that's the encouraging part of this so let's go through it before we really break down the match and really go into more detail i want to get your thoughts on the starting 11 were you surprised at all by the starting 11 or was this what you thought it was going to be it is what I thought it was going to be, given the suspension of Mitrovic and the injuries to Reem and Pereira. Um, you know, it was back to a more conventional starting 11. So the experimentation with Suarez, Lukic, Solomon, um, th that period of experimentation, I think, has ended. Um, and and Marcus Silva quite clearly has, has his favorites. So, you know, the main changes from what we had seen in previous games we're really dictated by injuries and suspension. Well, let me ask you about one player specifically. I was talking to a friend on my way home a little while ago. We're talking about the role of Carlos Vinicius. Has it changed, Craig? Now, I've seen a dramatic improvement from Mitro's suspension first happening till now. I want to give him a lot of credit. Does he give Marco some questions for the next few matches in regards to what he has offered. Now, obviously, Mitro comes back in. But Vinicius, I think, has shown a marked improvement. Your thoughts? It's hard to say because he's shown improvements with some of the weaker teams. Um, um, he had a good match. He had a goal and an assist. Um, but I thought overall that uh, that Leicester City were quite poor on the back. So it's a bit difficult to draw too many conclusions. I don't think it creates a selection headache for <laughs> Marco Silva. I think the question is whether we want to keep Vinicius for next season because we clearly do need to have depth in that number nine position. Well, has he shown you enough, Craig, to make you think about having him stick around? Because, again, there's speculation out there that there are going to be clubs interested in Vinicius do you need to see more? I'm curious where you fall on this because you said the qu the main question will be: Will Vinicius be a full player next season? Yeah. So, have you? Do you have enough information? Well, I think the clubs that will be principally interested in Vinicius will pro will probably be Championship clubs. I don't see too many Premier League clubs really chasing after him. So it's a question of whether we can find someone better in the uh in the market in the transfer market um as a kind of backup to to Mitrovic. you know one of the concerns i think we all have to have is the decline in mitro's form post the world cup um maybe it was due to injury maybe he may have been rushed back from injury um hard to say but his form has clearly uh, dropped and it would be interesting to see how he plays once uh, his suspension has ended. Okay, excellent stuff. Before we go into the match and we do first half analysis and then second half, I just want to just focus just a little bit on Leicester City because I actually went on a podcast 
of a Leicester City supporter last night. And I told him I thought this is actually a bad spot. I thought that even though everyone's saying playing Fulham is the right time, I actually thought it was the wrong time because I thought Fulham had something to prove coming off of two good performances. I thought Venetius had something to prove. I'm going to say Anthony Robinson potentially playing for a contract, maybe some other players as well. I actually thought this was not the best spot for them. That was just my opinion. I actually think they have a better shot against Liverpool. I said that before the match because I, I think they match up fairly well against Liverpool at the King Power Stadium. What did you make of their performance before we really break down the match? I thought they were pretty effective at times going forward, and they did put some pressure on us. I thought their press was a little bit half-hearted and not always all that well organized. And I thought defensively they were at times shambolic, uh, giving up the ball cheaply. Uh, they seemed to be very vulnerable as soon as they gave up the ball to the counterattack, uh, they didn't seem to have a way of stopping the counterattack, leaving us with quite a lot of space, and, and we were able to punish them time and again. Okay, excellent. Very good. All right, I'm just going to share this comment from Wayne Walden, who is watching live. Wayne says, hi, Russ. I must say that we played some outstanding football today, and Carlos Vinicius played very well. I agree with that, Wayne, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we break down both halves of this match. So, Craig, let's just – go into talking about the first half. And uh, I thought Fulham started off very brightly. I thought they were more likely to score. Obviously, we'll talk about the first goal. But uh, I thought, again, I thought they were dominant throughout the first half. But I'm glad that we keep going back to the fact that Leicester City were still creating opportunities, correct? So even though we're going to focus more on Fulham's goals here and how they played, Leicester City were really – trying to get on the front foot and, and taking their opportunities when they had them. It just didn't fall for them in the first half. It fell for Fulham. So let's really just start by talking about Fulham's first goal. And uh, when you look at this, is this just about William just getting the ball in a very dangerous area, Craig, and making the goalkeeper make a decision? Should we be seeing more of this from players? You know, just get it into the danger zone and see what happens. What are your thoughts about William scoring on the first goal early in the match? I don't think William intended to put it on goal, but it was a very good, it was a very good free kick because it it forced quite, it it forced the goalkeeper to, to to answer some questions. The goal and he, I think it looked to me that Iverson had come out and then took a step back because I, I assume because he thought somebody might head the ball, um, and that moment of indecision was fatal for. Um, for for Leicester City, um, it is a goal that you do see from time to time. Um, you know, from that angle when there's a free kick, um, so it was well placed ball. It caused maximum mayhem, and in that particular case, um, you know, it worked out quite well for us. Okay, very good there, my friend. Okay, so Fulham are up one nil, and uh, let's now focus on the second goal. And again, what's interesting about this? This really is Fulham breaking quickly. And I think this goal, again, few players have something to do with this. Carlos Vinicius, I thought, played well. We can talk about that a little bit. But this, to me, I want to give Harry Wilson some credit here, Craig, because I think we're starting to see the end of the season, the Harry Wilson that we saw last season. Your thoughts on the goal and his role, of course, Vinicius as well. And if you want to add anyone else, please feel free to. Yeah, look, I, I, if I recall correctly, the goal was set up um, when uh, Polina intercepted the ball, and so it was right. off the counterattack. And I think what was impressive was how quickly we counterattacked. Um, you're right, Harry Wilson really uh, set it up very well. Uh, Polina and Harry Wilson set it up extremely well. It was the speed of the counterattack. And the finish by Vinicius was very good. Yes. It was a one-on-one -on -one with the goalkeeper. Again, I thought Iverson probably should have gotten come out of off his line a little bit faster to shut it down. You could argue. Um, I would need to see the replay, and I have not seen match of the day yet. Um, but uh, it was a good counterattack. It was a Real Madrid style counterattack. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it, my friend. So Fulham up two 0 and as we're talking about this, because we're getting near to the end of the half, and if I remember correctly. In my memory, I believe that uh, Leicester City had an opportunity or two, but then we have the third goal. I, I do I, want to dwell on that opportunity, Russ. 
Go ahead. I, go ahead. I think I think it was a key moment actually in the game. Go ahead. Uh, it was a square pass by Anthony Robinson. Oh, uh, Vardy but... had a great shot on goal, and it was yeah, a very good save by Leno, who arguably has been our our most valuable player of the season. And it was a superb save. And you know there were a couple of moments in this match, notwithstanding the penalty later on, right? Uh, that committed by Leno. There were a couple of moments in this match where I really think that. Leno, Leno's intervention made this game a lot easier than it otherwise could have been. <laughs> That's a very good point. I don't think Bruno Leno will say this is one of my better performances. He did make some mistakes. I'm glad that you talked about this. But what's interesting about this, and I'm glad that you brought up Anthony Robinson, because they said on the broadcast, you're at the match live, that basically, I'm paraphrasing that, Anthony Robinson is basically just could not thank – Fern Leno Moore for saving himself there because that was a just a terrible mistake. I don't know what he was thinking there, Craig, with that mistake from Jedi. He's been very good lately. I don't know what was going through his mind with that pass. It was just a square pass. It, you know, it happens, and he just didn't see where it was. It's a, it's a pretty big mistake. You have to be careful when you make those square passes because right. if, there, if, uh, if there's somebody who's lurking, you know, suddenly you you could be on the back foot, and that's exactly what happened. But um, we had a little bit of an escape there. Absolutely. I'm just going to share this comment. We have a, a few comments. I'll share some more, but this is one from Chris Mullins. Says, Carlos is finding form at the wrong time as Mitro is back next week, and likely we'll start. You're probably right about that, my friend. Okay, so now let's talk about a very interesting third goal. And this, to me, is more to do with Fulham's tenacity, Fulham – getting after full and not happy with just having two goals because they really created this and they put the pressure on Leicester city. But what's interesting about this, I've been one that says, I want to see Tom Kearney use his right foot. Craig, I got to say, I was pleasantly surprised that he scored this goal with his right foot. A great finish by Tom Kearney. I, I want to give him a huge shout out to Tom Kearney. I did not see this coming. Your thoughts on Kearney's first goal and Fulham's third goal. If I recall correctly, the Leicester City defender didn't clear the ball properly, and we intercepted. We were putting some pressure on them, but it was a really poor clearance. And again, they, were, you know, on the counterattack, it was just very, it was some pretty slick passing, and we had the space. And yes, it was a good finish by Tom Kearney on, on his right foot. Um, sort of inexplicable playing a little bit by. You know, let's just say at, the, at this level, you cannot, you know, you either clear it or you don't. You don't right. sort of. I think he hit it to Pellini. I'm not sure. Sh- I'm not sure. Um, you know, it's 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 sort of again, kind of emblematic. I think of a lot of the games where I felt that Leicester City let themselves down. Um, in, in in you know they gave up the ball cheaply at times and were very vulnerable to the counterattack. Absolutely, and as we just analyzed the first half, because Fulham go into the half up three 0 Craig, I just want to get your overall analysis of uh, Fulham's play in the first half. I thought it was overall pretty good, although there were times when Leicester City seemed to be actually looking fairly polished and composed going forward. That's the only sort of fly in the ointment of what was a pretty dominant first half for Fulham. Uh, you know, we passed well, we moved well, um, and I thought the the team seemed to 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 gel pretty well. With um, you know, in particular, I thought the midfield and the players up front were were working very hard. We dominated possession, and we didn't really seem to be. Um, in too many difficulties, except when they, when Leicester city got a head of steam to move forward, sometimes they put us a little bit on the back foot. There was right. another sort of half chance. There's a ball that flashed across the goal. Um, you know, just as a reminder that we, we, we are sometimes vulnerable. What do you make so far as we're talking about this? Cause we're going to talk about the second half and the goals from Leicester city, the partnership of Diop and Tosin so far. Um, they don't hand look, they don't have the technical quality that Tim Ream has, which I think makes it a little bit easier to uh break down 
a press and to get the ball into the midfield more quickly. Um, but look, they're they're pretty strong in the air. Um, not that Leicester City. I mean, Leicester City is James Vardy up front, right? But Vardy didn't really pose too many difficulties. I thought Madison was a bit more dangerous. Totally uh, for, um, and you know, because at times I think we struggled to pick him up. Totally agree with that. And now we're going to focus transition and talk about the second half, Craig. And very early on, Fulham get their fourth goal. I, I want to say it was around maybe somewhere in the 55th, 57th minute, somewhere around there. They get their fourth goal. And again, it's Tom Kearney. And this is, again, a little bit of a break on for Fulham. Give me your thoughts on Fulham going up 4 0. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the goal. There were so many goals in the game, <laughs> and I haven't seen the replay. How, how was it set up again? Just remind me. Uh, I'm trying to remember myself. I just remember us breaking fairly quickly, and the ball, fought, I think it goes out wide, and eventually oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. settles in. It goes that. out to it Kenny Tete. Tete. Kenny Tete, Kenny Tete. Broke down. Yes. Again, they, I think they lost the ball again because Kenny Tete was a counterattack down the right exactly. side. Kenny Tete crossed the ball, <laughs> and it was actually quite a good finish by – um, by Kearney, but you know, it was the story of the game. As soon as Leicester City would lose the ball, we were quick, quick, and clinical. I would yes. say Real Madrid like on the counter attack and uh, and the finishing, but they also left us way too much space and made it a little too easy for us. Totally agree, Craig. And that actually surprised me because whenever we were breaking, Harry Wilson seemed to have mountains of space when, when yeah. he was able to operate, and I, I found that. A little, I wasn't expecting that because they were really focusing on taking it to Fulham. They left themselves exposed, and Fulham took advantage of it. But actually, played into a strength of Fulham, and thankfully, they were able to score the goals in this match. So now, let's focus on the first goal, and there are three goals, three unfortunate goals that Fulham give up here. And the first one was a goal, I believe, by Harvey Barnes. Your thoughts on Leicester City's first goal? I'm not going to say this came out of nothing. There were some warning signs throughout the match. They were dangerous, and I he actually hits the crossbar, and it goes in, my friend. goes right in there. Yeah, it was at the other end of the pitch for me. Um, it, it, quake, it, it, it was very apparent after we scored in the 51st minute or whatever, uh, the fourth goal, that um, we were on cruise control, and we weren't really pressing them that tightly. And we had ceded a lot of the initiative over to to Leicester City. That, I mean, my, my recollection is that that goal was actually fairly well well taken. Yep. Um, I, I can't remember how it was set up exactly, but we were giving them a lot of space, and we we had stopped really harassing them, and we also stopped. You know, before we were kind of dominating ball possession and. And all, suddenly we were letting them have a lot of time on the ball. Okay. So at this point in the match, Craig, it's four to one. And then it gets a little nervy because now we're going to talk about the penalty saved by Leno. But this is also a, an error by Leno. He comes in late with Jamie Vardy and Jenny, Jamie Vardy gets the penalty. And I think the history of Burn Leno has not been good Saving penalties. Well, he took care of business. This is on the other end. Do you get a good look of the penalty save yeah, by Leno? Yeah, I mean, the penalty, you know, you, you, you can blame Leno, but uh, was it uh, Diop? I mean, he got behind one of yep. our defenders, and so that forces Leno to come out. So I, I think it's a bit harsh to lay it all on Leno. And Leno was just a, a, a second too late. Um, I think they took it to VAR and, uh, to confirm the penalty. Um, look, the penalty save was really good, and 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 it kind of, I think at that point there was a there was a re, you know really deflated um, Leicester City. I mean, there they, there would have been the possibility of a fight back if Vardy had scored because they won four to two. They would have had a bit of momentum, one more goal, and all of a sudden you start getting a little bit nervous. No. But uh, when he saved that, I think by that point. It, you know, it was it was quite clear that Fulham were going to take the three points. Totally agree, Craig. And that's going to be followed up. After that, we have the situation with Fulham's fifth goal. And this 
goal again. This you probably got a very good view yeah, of William, and I gotta tell you, this is a great goal by William. Thirty-four Class. years old, Class. and he's able to still do this, Craig. It, it's amazing. Talk about Bones' fifth goal and and the shot and goal by William here. You you said you got a good view. Yeah, look, I mean, you know, it was a kind of manner Solomon kind of goal, right? Yeah, you know, it cuts in. It cuts in from the left the left onto the right. He's actually scored a couple of goals like that this season, William. And it's clearly part of our strategy is getting the ball on the left and then cutting over to the right. Um, sometimes we have a you have, we have an overlap on the left wing to create a little bit of space. Not sure that was the case here, but he had enough space to get actually a pretty good shot on goal. And it was a great finish. Um, I'm a bit, again, I, I have to, you have to ask questions though about Leicester City because he kind of waltzed around with the ball without right. too without too many players around him. Now, in Leicester City's defense, they were probably throwing men forward um, to try to uh, uh, get back into the game, but uh, he did have an awful lot of space. But it was a great finish, really. I mean, he was outside the box. He was well outside the box. He had hit that well and precisely. Okay, excellent stuff. So. At this point, you already mentioned Fulham were on cruise control. So now we're at five we were to singing, one. Just so you know, Russ. Yes. We were singing songs to Shane Duffy. Uh, <laughs> and the, and, and there were like, it was like one song after another about <laughs> Shane Duffy. Uh, That's and, great. And, That's uh, fantastic. You know, and it was, a, in fact, I would say Shane Duffy is was just, uh, that's all. And so when he was eventually substituted on. Yeah. The the joy and elation from the Hammersmith end was uncontained. Okay, so I'm glad that you mentioned that because I wasn't expecting Shane Duffy to come on. So so for you at Craven Cottage, this is actually a, a good moment. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I I wasn't aware that Shane Duffy had become, you know, I've been away for a couple of weeks. I, I wasn't aware that Shane Duffy had become, uh, you know, an, an immediate Fulham legend. But um, <laughs> I mean, every song that we sang, you know, was changed. The lyrics were changed to, to include Shane Duffy. Sorry, Shane Duffy, not Sean Duffy, Shane Duffy. Shane Duffy. And, uh, uh, it was, it was incredible. They think we we're going to build a statue to Shane Duffy. Uh, <laughs> you're only here to watch the, the Duffy, you know, <gasps> that's it was great. one song after another. Oh, that's great. Okay. Well, let's now talk about some bad, stuff from foam so let's talk about the second penalty for leicester city and uh, i've watched this back you will see this on match of the day at first glance craig because this is on the other end yeah i know you did not get a good view of this at first glance you're saying well it, he didn't even touch him but if you watch back and you'll see it he does clip him he clips him and so it actually i think it's a penalty so unfortunately for foam now the match becomes 5-2. Your thoughts about this stage, is this more to do with just, um, like you said, being on cruise control? Absolutely. We, we had seeded the initiative. Um, I think we were putting in substitutions. We looked. We just did not look particularly sharp. There's no urgency in our play. No. And um, the penalty look, it was out of nothing, right? But they, they you know, we weren't winning second balls. We weren't really hard in the tackle. And this is the kind of thing that just happens when you you, you forget that you have to play 90-plus minutes to in, in the game. Okay. Well, that's going to lead to talk about the third goal, which was just ridiculous, Craig. And this never should have happened, but this goes back to maybe a mentality, taking your foot off the gas and letting a team back in the match. I know it's still – Five to three, Craig. But it didn't need to be this nervy in the end. I know it's still two goals, but you never know. You never know. So never thoughts, know. On, thoughts on Leicester City making it five to three. It just didn't need to happen. Well, you know, the fans were singing for Shane Duffy, but that was a pretty no. bizarre <laughs> mix-up between him and and Leno. And I, I, I don't. I mean, it was kind of inexplicable almost. Um, but it's the kind of thing that happens when you just don't have concentration. You just want to see out the game. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I don't even know what to say about it. I haven't seen something, this, this kind of fiasco. And I don't know who's to blame. But um, there was clearly a miscommunication between Duffy and, uh, 
and Leno. What's amazing was that um, they almost didn't score. I mean, uh, the, I know, know. Uh, Le- Leno made one save, I think, but uh, they almost didn't score. But it was a little bit of a farcical. Um, I mean, there's no other word for it. I mean, there's nothing tactical to say about it. No. Um, that didn't stop the fans from continuing to sing for Shane Duffy. I, I love that. I, I still love that. I love that they were they were doing that throughout the match. But like I mentioned, so now it's five to three. Fulham do see the match out. There are again some nervy moments, but they see the match out, my friend. And uh, what was your reaction at, after the match was over? My reaction after the match was over was we were sloppy. We were a bit you know, lazy and unfocused after we were up 4-0. But we were clearly the better team, and uh, and we showed our class. It's just, I thought the scoreline, at the end of the day, the scoreline flattered Leicester City. I agree. You know, what I think is that, you know, teams like Leicester City, Leeds, they're in a relegation battle um, with Everton and, the, and Nottingham Forest, and it's going to be, it's going to be pretty tight at the bottom. Um, of the table, but you know there are, as we saw with the leads at the Leeds game as well. There are serious deficiencies in these teams. They're not bad teams. They're not incompetent teams, but they 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 have some serious issues, especially in the back. They're shipping in too many goals. They leave too much space. Um, their players don't quite have the quality that even the mid tables uh, mid table teams have. And we'll see where we end up. Um, but I, if I were Leicester City, I, I'd be a little bit worried about that performance. It was just too slack uh, of a performance from them, and they made it too easy for Fulham. Totally agree, Craig. Okay, coming up next to end the show, I'll be sharing some of your questions that you've been sharing to us, and I'll end with Man of the Match. If you're watching live, feel free to share your thoughts on who was Man of the Match. Okay, Craig, let's get to it. Let's talk about man of the match. Who was your man of the match, my friend? Well, it would have to be Shane Duffy because, <laughs> you know, otherwise I, I will probably get lynched in the uh, in the Hammersmith end. But if I put aside Shane Duffy for a moment. Yeah, put him aside. I think I think William should be the man of the match. I think he scored two really good goals, um, and I think he was a threat throughout um, you could say Kearney yep. would have a good shout. Um, you know, even Paulinho or Vinicius. But I, I think um, I think William for me, you know, his ability to score goals, um, the class that he shows on the ball, the movement he has, and he really is at times a cut above really everybody else on the pitch, technically and and uh, and physically. Well, let me ask you this, and then I'm going to share some comments. Do you think William can continue to do this if Fulham signed him for another season? Do you think he still has another season in him, Craig? Your thoughts? I don't know. I don't, I don't know when players drop off. I mean, he's he's 34. I know. I wouldn't be signing him to a five-year contract. <laughs> but um, look, you know, he – you know. Th- he adds something. He adds a big dimension to the team, um, a certain technical quality yeah. that we really need at this level. Um, and the question is whether he can sustain, you know, um, he, whether he can sustain the physical demands uh, of of his role. Um, he fits well within the sort of four two three one four three three system that we have, right. which relies on crosses, but also wingers that can cut in and and so you know i think he's i think he's been a really strong performer for us over the course of the season totally agree i totally agree i i didn't see it coming craig but he's been great we have the elder statesman him and tim ream still able to do it and uh i wouldn't bet against them i'm just gonna say that i i don't know what's gonna happen with tim ream next season but I still wouldn't bet against him. I wouldn't bet against William. We'll have to see what happens. Okay. Well, if you look at Tom Brady, the, how long he's been able to play at the yeah. top level. No, but on a serious note, I, 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 I don't know. You know. At some point, these players, they slow down, and even the, even the smallest loss of, of, of pace can be absolutely fatal at this level. I mean, players in the premiership are just too good. Right. Um, 
to and and the margin for error is is too small. Okay. But very cool. look, you know, Will, William Will, William deserved to me the man of the match. He scored two really good goals, yeah. and you know he, he they had to deal with him. Totally agree, Craig. Okay, I'm going to share some more comments here. Well, actually, for man of the match, Chris Mullins says man of the match, Wilson or William. Thoughts yeah. on Wilson? Good game. Yeah, really good game. Um, created a lot of problems as well. So, yeah, I thought it was actually one of the better games for, for Harry. Okay. Wayne says, William, man of the match. Here's an interesting one now. We've been critical of the ref lately. Steve Reynolds says, shout out for the ref. Had a good game. Well, at the start of the game, the, the referee had some issues with his equipment. And so the kickoff was delayed by a few minutes. And uh, in the Hammersmith end, we were already singing, you're not fit to referee. <laughs> so, um, which was a kind of harsh judgment because it's not really the ref's fault. But the fact is, I can't really recall that we ever even talked about the ref. I can't recall very many issues around the ref. He, he pulled out some cards early on. Yeah. I think when, when um, Leicester City were, were trying to kick our guys, and I think that calmed down play because I think Leicester City were trying to kick us off our game. So I would agree with Steve. I thought the ref probably had a pretty good game. It's not okay. an easy job either. No, it certainly isn't, my friend. It really isn't. Let's see. Let's see. This is uh, from our friend here. It says, Santa Dude, greetings from Switzerland. William or TC, man of the match. Reed was great too. Underrated as usual. Here's an interesting one. And I, I don't know if I've mentioned this to you, Craig, and you're going to know this former U.S. men's national team player, Eric Winalda. I watch and listen to a lot of the shows on uh, Sirius XM radio called Counterattack. And yeah. Eric Winalda, about a month and a half ago, was very critical of Harrison Reed and said that there are some players that really aren't Premier League players. He singled out Harrison Reed. I think he couldn't be more wrong about Harrison Reed. It was a bad game for Harrison Reed. If Eric Winalda watched most of his matches, I think he would change his mind. I thought Harrison Reed was very good in this match. I thought Harrison Reed was was excellent in this match. I mean, a lot of times we were passing them very quickly, quick triangles, breaking them down, and he was very much a part of that play. Um, I think Harrison Reed belongs in the Premiership. Is he in the top, uh, you know, top quartile of, of midfielders? Probably not, but he's he's certainly a very solid performer. You know, his nickname, as you may know, is the Ginger, Ginger Iniesta. Yeah. Um, and, you know, his ball control and his vision uh, are, and his technical qualities are very good. He's not the biggest. He's not probably the, the quickest. Um, but he, he, he had a good game. Yeah, I, I would agree. Okay, very good there, my friend. All right. And Wayne actually shares this. Harrison Reed played very well. I would agree with that. Okay. Craig, great show. Thank you so much for joining me and contacting me and, and want, wanting to do a show. I, I love doing shows, obviously, anytime, but it's special when we can do it after a convincing victory. I know 5-3, to three, like you said, it, it flatters Leicester City a little bit with the three goals, but this was a convincing victory. Look, we're in 48 points. Um, we're now six points clear, I think, of Chelsea. With, although I love Chelsea, that. But Chelsea have played one fewer game. Um, you know, let's see where we end up. It'll, I think we, we're, we have a good chance of staying in the top 10. But I think we're beating the teams we should beat. And, um, and that's going to stand us in good stead between now and the rest of the season. I don't think Europe is a realistic objective no. at this point. Obviously, relegation is out of the question. So what we want to try to do is, you know, if we can get to 10th or even 9th in the table, that would be a fantastic achievement. I think the number one objective has to be to finish above Chelsea in the table. <laughs> I'm there with you, Craig. I actually want the points total. I want them to get to 53. That means two more victories. So let's see if they can do it. I actually think they can do it. They have a good chance. You're talking about that they're going to be facing Roy again. Crystal Palace, they'll have the opportunity against Southampton. And then, of course, you're going to end with Manchester United. 
That to me is a grudge match, my friend. The Manchester United match should be very interesting. Look, yeah, Manchester United obviously are struggling again, um, and and so maybe we can um, we can take advantage of that. Yeah. I think the game against Crystal Palace will be interesting because, you know, Roy Hodgson knows how to um, make a team very difficult to defeat. Yep. He organizes the squad extremely well. I'm told the players find his practices boring, but you know he instills a kind of positional and tactical discipline like no other manager can. And, um, you know, he's obviously a beloved figure at yeah. Craven Cottage um, and um, and with good reason. And uh, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what he does, because he's got some work still to do with with Crystal Palace to ensure that they uh, stay up. Okay, very good. And I will say, I remember when Roy was uh, the manager of Fulham, I've heard stories that the players thought it was boring to the training sessions. I don't care. They just won. They were disciplined together as one. And that's what's happening again with Crystal Palace and uh, other supporters say if Liverpool can knock Roy all they want. It gets full love from me from what he gave me as the manager of Fulham Football Club. All right, my friend. Great show. Final thoughts before we uh, wrap this up. Look, it's been a it's been a great season for us. I think we have a lot of technical quality in the team. We do have some deficiencies that I think will need to be addressed in the in the off season in the transfer market. Um, we we're going to actually probably have to do a fair amount of work of strengthening the club. But what it does encourage me is that the team is technically very strong and you can see their superiority uh, against some of these other teams. Okay. I'm going to share this one comment because this is an interesting one that I've been thinking myself. I actually don't think this is going to happen, but what are your thoughts about, sorry about that, Ron, there's there's a Goldman for you. Luke Harris needs game time. I agree with this, but I don't see him getting it the rest of the season. Yeah. Look, I mean, it, it, the question is: It's a bit like in basketball when when you when you put on the the the, the back the, the rest of the bench, right? Yeah. Um, you know, the you you could argue Marco Silva should be experimenting experimenting with some more players, giving them time so we can check them out because we're safely mid table, um, but every spot. You know, in the league, that that's that's real money, yep. for one thing, and for another thing, you know, if you sort of limp into the finish, I even think that doesn't do Marco Silva a lot of good for himself. So, you know, I think the objective is to run through the tape, and that may mean that uh, Luke Harris doesn't get the kind of game time that uh, David Callahan would like him to get. Okay, and Chris Mullins pretty much seconds this: give Harris time against Saints. I understand where the supporters are coming from. I just think I agree with you, Craig. I just don't see it. I wouldn't be against it, but I think that Marco is going to side on trying to get as many points and play as strong as side. So even though it makes sense what David and Chris are sharing here, I just don't see it. I would be not against it at all. I'd be for it, but I just don't see Marco doing it. I know that uh, I want to say uh, Scott Parker did this with Fabio two seasons ago, but Fulham were down at that point. This is different. This is different right now. I think that Marco wants to see how far up the table Fulham can go here. Can they, or can they stay where they are? Can they get it ahead of Chelsea? Can they get the points total? That's why I don't see Luke Harris getting a shot, but I wouldn't be against it. I'll, I'll end with that. Okay. Craig, as always, thank you so much for doing the show with me. I I enjoyed this. Thanks a lot, Russ. And uh, all the best to you. Okay. Fantastic. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of College Talk. As always, please do subscribe on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. It does help other form supporters find us. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. For Craig Coleman, I'm Russ Coleman. Thank you as always for watching and listening to College Talk, now part of the Talk Sport Fan Network.